Thank you very much, Dr. Turk. Very interesting discussion. Um, maybe I'll take the, uh, the prerogative of asking the first question, if I may. And then we're going to have microphones, I think. Uh, we're going to have microphones. Uh, do we have a microphone for Dr. Turk here? That's the. Uh... It should be working now. Does it work? Okay. Oh, very good. All right. I'll put it here. Okay. And working okay. Uh, you you mentioned the Syria crisis, yes. And one of the problems I think that the special envoys of the Secretary General has had in negotiating uh, a ceasefire and a peace agreement over these last years. You mentioned three different envoys now. Is some kind of paralysis in the Security Council itself? Is that a sign that the Security Council? really must be expanded to include a more representative uh, power structure in the world today. The, the, power, the, the Security Council with, this, with the permanent members is really uh, a legacy of the World War II era, which is some 70 years ago. And I wonder if an expanded Security Council would actually facilitate uh, better solutions, quicker solutions to these uh, seemingly intractable problems that get bogged down in the Security Council? This is, of course, a question, but I think my microphone works, so okay. I, yeah. No, this is a question which is very often asked, and I also am one of those who, who is asking that question. Would uh, an expanded Security Council be a more effective Security Council? And I realize that there are different opinions on that. I think that the current permanent members are likely to remain permanent members, um, irrespective of possible change in the foreseeable future. One therefore talks about added members, either only non-permanent or both permanent and non-permanent. Uh, this, of course, entirely depends on the member states of the United Nations. I'd like to emphasize that the Secretary General of the United Nations cannot do very much on this particular subject, because this is entirely in the province of member states. And all earlier discussions which involved the, sec the Secretary General could not produce any significant, uh, any significant contribution. There was, in 2004, a proposal by the Panel on Threats, Challenges, and Change, in which uh, Mr. Amr Musa, at that time uh, Secretary General of the Arab League, participated. And that report has produced two models of expansion of the Security Council. The Secretary General gave a kind of a general support to this. Kofi Annan gave a general support to this approach and say, well, member states, please take a look at these two options. and." Uh, tell us what would be the right way. Uh, not unexpectedly, that discussion did not lead to an agreement. So the problem is squarely within the, uh, within this, among the members of the United Nations, so the Secretary General cannot do very much in that regard. Of course, one can ask how is the international political climate evolving and whether that would change soon to allow a reform of the of the composition of the Security Council. Right now, the political conditions don't seem to be particularly uh, propitious for any such change. So we are probably uh, more likely to continue to have the Security Council in its current composition and with its current problems. Now, that does not mean that an expanded Security Council will, would automatically be a more effective council. Now, the question on effectiveness and size has been there for more than 20 years, and states could not agree that 
An expanded size of the Council would inevitably mean more effective Council. It would certainly add to the representative character of the Council, clearly, because the world has changed and that uh, can be expressed in an expanded number. Uh, but as far as the effectiveness is concerned, the um, results of discussions so far have not been positive. I think we have to realistically accept this situation and then uh, work with the Council as it is and also see uh, whether the international climate is going to change gradually to a point at which such discussions can produce a new agreement. This is as far as I can go. If I went further, I would probably be in the realm of fantasy rather than in, in the realm of analysis. Thank you very much. Can we take some questions from the floor, please? Uh, Ambassador Fahmi. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President, for, for being here, and thank you for your comments and presentations. Let, let me take advantage of being the host and push you a little bit. Two issues have been long-standing at the UN, the Arab-Israeli peace process or the, or the Arab-Israeli conflict, the longest ongoing conflict remains unresolved and the UN role is highly diminished in that respect. And another is nuclear disarmament. The very first GA resolution was on nuclear disarmament. And frankly, within the UN, very little progress has been achieved. Where it has been, it's been outside the UN. Uh, where do you see that in the priorities in the future? But the other question, which is a little bit more pushy, what kind of Secretary General do you think is, is fit for this new global order. In the past, we had the, what we call the Hammarskjöld model, where you had a proactive uh, Secretary General, and we even had Dr. Potosrelli, who got into some differences with a number of uh, powerful countries because of his, uh, again, initiatives. Do you believe that Secretary General is simply the manager of the UN? In other words, what the what the countries want, or is he the leader of the UN and therefore has a more proactive role in pushing and pulling countries to take uh, progressive positions? Thank you, sir. Well, on the first question, I would say um, the UN has been, um, I think, too passive on the question of Palestine and the broader Arab-Israeli uh, situation in the past years. Now, one could say that there are um, understandable reasons for that, which, which have to do with political situation in the region and with the major powers. But I think that this situation is unsatisfactory, because without a uh, solution of the Palestinian question, the permanent <coughs> stability in this region will not be possible. The question is whether the time of two-state solution has run out, or is this still a valid basis for search for a solution? I think it continues to be the only viable and valid basis for a permanent solution. I think that one should not forget the Arab League peace plan of 2002, which remains the most complete platform and which offered also the most complete solution, which was a complete peace for complete recognition. I think that that's a very valuable a political element which has not lose, lost its importance over time. Of course, over time we have seen a layer of political developments which make this return to these principles more difficult. But the principles are still there, they remain valid, and there has to be a way found to revive uh, diplomatic action for, in, in favor of that. Now, I know that in the coming days there will be a visit of the Foreign Minister of France and that France is contemplating diplomatic initiatives which would help reviving the process. I hope this will lead to success. These ideas are discussed informally also in the Security Council and elsewhere. And they, I think, demonstrate that the, uh, that the idea, that the wish to move ahead towards two-state solution is very much alive. It's not very visible now, given everything else that is happening in the region, but it is alive and it will, it will be the only way to, uh, to establish a durable, just, fair, and lasting peace. 
On disarmament, the situation is, um, uh, I think, at this point, not very promising. We have seen the um, gradual erosion of authority of certain basic concepts of disarmament, which have been developed in the past. We have seen that also in the area of non-proliferation, we do not have the kind of energy which is necessary to sustain this idea. Of course, non-proliferation treaty has been extended indefinitely, but treaties are not only formal documents, treaties have to live. And uh, there is a possibility that erosion of this um, authority of disarmament and non-proliferation could produce harm. So I think that a new Secretary General would have to look into these matters creatively and come with proposals. The fact that this was not done in recent past should not, de should not discourage that search. That is as much as I can say on the disarmament and non-proliferation issue. And of course, the second question, which uh, uh, is um, something that not only I expect, but I have to think about, <laughs> given the fact that I am one of the candidates, um, is, is as follows. I think the Secretary General cannot be and should not be reduced to the managing position. Of course, the Charter speaks of the Secretary General as the Chief Administrative Officer uh, in Article 97. And that's important because the Secretary General has to manage a large organization and an organization which is changing. I would like to just to mention by way of example that nowadays 55% of all UN personnel, not talking about those in uniform, but 55% of all non-uniform personnel is in the field, not in headquarters. And that more than 80% of those who are in the field are serving in what is called hardship positions, hardship posts. So, you know, you have, one has to understand how much UN has changed and how much more demanding the whole management has become. And of course, the Secretary General has to perform his function as Chief Administrative Officer conscientiously. And of course, with the necessary attention to problems as they arise, with the necessary imagination to stimulate rotation so that people come from the headquarters to the field and then go back to headquarters and so forth. There are sometimes serious questions um, raised about this and difficulties in implementing, but this is, of course, one of the tasks. I think, however, that it would be wrong to reduce the tasks of the Secretary General to management. I think that uh, there has to be a ref reform creation and ability to lead. The question is, how is this done? Now, I worked with Kofi Annan uh, in the Secretariat. I was his assistant for political affairs. And we have discussed these uh, questions often. We often agreed in the Secretariat at that time that reforms are necessary, but that each reform is a process. None of the reforms happens overnight. When the Secretary General has to come with reforms, understanding the whole evolution before his decisions or before his proposals, and come with that at an appropriate moment and expect something to change. I mentioned the example of the Human Rights Council as a typical case of reform. So the formulation of proposals for reform is part of the Secretary General's mandate, and that goes beyond the technical definition of a chief administrative <coughs> officer. And finally, the Secretary General has also to be able to produce a kind of a moral compass. It's very important what the Secretary General says, what kind of sense of urgency he adds to the activities of the United Nations, what kind of courage he shows with, the, with taking positions towards different problems. And in that way, in a, in, a, in a continuous process, leadership of a particular kind can be exercised. But then again, the Secretary General has to understand that he remains the servant of the organization. The organization belongs to member states and they have the decisive say. In everything that is being done, there is a need to appreciate this very basic fact. Reform proposals will succeed only, not only if they are 
sufficiently well thought through. They also have to be acceptable to member states. Leadership can be exercised only if member states are willing to go along. And of course, there is a very sensitive line between um, moral exhortation and moral leadership. So the Secretary General has to be aware of that and has to be able to formulate his moral vision in a way which constitutes leadership. Now, I know that this does not sound very specific, but I can tell you, the Secretary General comes to this, to this office at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, with a set of problems waiting for him and ends his work day with another set of problems. And in the meantime, he has to take positions both on the morning problems and everything else that comes during the daytime. So it's really very concrete when it, when it is done. But to answer a question which is generally formulated, I would say yes, in all three areas, administration, reforms, and moral leadership, the Secretary General has to be able to perform as expected. Sir? Uh, I'm Hussein Hassoun, a former ambassador of Egypt. Uh, first, Dr. Turk, I'd like to thank you very much for your interesting presentation and also to welcome you in, in Egypt. I had the pleasure of working with you at the United Nations for many years and I always appreciated your uh, leadership and, and knowledge. Um, I, I think personally that you are one of the most qualified uh, uh, for, for, for this job of Secretary General. My, my only comment is that I would have wished that the, your group, uh, the Eastern European group, would have had one candidate uh, for that post uh, since uh, there are so many. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it makes it a bit more difficult for you, but I still uh, wish, you, wish you all the best. I have two questions. Uh, one, you talked about the reform of the United Nations. Uh, I think that Egypt and many of my colleagues here present, we worked for years to, uh, to adopt reforms at, at the United Nations. And you said it came gradually and uh, uh, over the years. But I think there are still certain things which have to be changed. If the United Nations is going to, to play a crucial role in this world today, because all the problems in this world are of a global nature and we need global solution, we, we, we have to, to uh, reach a, a, a total reform somehow. It's not just a matter of enlarging the Security Council. It's a matter of, of more transparency. It's a matter of the, uh, the big permanent uh, countries not giving precedence to the national interests over sometimes the legal obligation. Uh, the, the also, the, the big powers using force uh, without authorization of the Security Council, as has happened in, in Iraq and has happened in Kosovo. Uh, I think we need to give more powers to the General Assembly. We, we need the United Nations to seek more advisory opinions from the International uh, Court of Justice. We need the Secretary General also to use more his powers under Article 99 uh, to, to, to take more initiatives. Y you are an international lawyer, and so am I and I have the pleasure to working with uh, Judge Petrich in the United Nations in International Law Commission. Uh, and and I, I would like to, to know your, your vision about this, if, if you may, in, in, in a more precise way. The second question is to follow up on Ambassador Fahmi's question about the uh, Arab-Israeli problem, and mainly the Palestinian issue. We have known that uh, for after many years of struggle, the Palestinians have lately acquired by the United Nations the status of non-member state, observer state. And this is a big achievement that the international community has recognized to the, United, to the, to the Palestinians for the first time the status of a state. And this has led, of course, President Abbas in 2014 to sign uh, 32 treaties and conventions. What, in your view, as an international lawyer, would be uh, the implications for this, for the Palestinians? Because I think it's, it's an achievement which should not be overlooked, 
and uh, we, we have to, to think about uh, helping them, even if the political solution is, is far away, maybe as some would think, I think to, to get this new status in the world community is, is a big success for the Palestinians. Thank you. Well, I thank Ambassador Hasuna for his questions. And as you have um, understood from the formulation of the question, he really is a person who knows uh, United Nations very well, has deep knowledge and deep understanding of the United Nations. And let me use a few uh, illustrations um, by way of commenting on the elements of your question. First, transparency. Well, you know, the current process of selection of the Secretary General is a step in the direction of greater transparency. It started with a General Assembly resolution last September that specified the kind of procedure which never existed before. Uh, before the, uh, all, the whole selection process was done behind the closed doors in the Security Council and the General Assembly only approved what was, what was coming. Now this time the Assembly has required all the candidates to come to New York and to be engaged in what is called informal dialogues. And I'm going to be in New York in mid-April for the informal dialogue, which will be very transparent. And we were told that the candidates will have the opportunity to give a vision of the UN in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And then uh, the rest of the time to fill the, the, the slot of two hours will be questions and answers of member states. So that tells you a little bit about transparency and about the nature of the United Nations, which is really about member states choosing their servant, the Secretary General. So that is one interesting aspect. There will be also involvement of civil society, but it will be more restricted. Uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, are already sending questions to the President of the General Assembly who will make a selection. And then with the President of the General Assembly will put those questions before the candidates. That's an improvement, but it also shows a hierarchy. NGOs are not at the same level as states. They will have much less time. And then the media. Immediately after those two hours, there will be a media stakeout with candidates. So those of you who have worked uh, in New York know how the media in that country work and how uh, very little um, uh, patience they have with people who appear before cameras. So this tells you a little bit how transparency is progressing. And I think that in many areas of work of the UN, transparency is uh, uh, given a space which, which was not there before. Um, now, more powers to the General Assembly. I mean, the, the powers that show, that are illustrated by this example of selection of the Secretary General, show the will of, this, of the General Assembly to move ahead, to, to claim more powers. But I would suggest that this has to be demonstrated in the entire agenda, including with regard to the security issues. Uh, let me give you another specific example. In 1999, the situation in the Congo started to deteriorate very badly. I don't know, Ambassador Hasuna, if you were in New York at that time, but that was a very dramatic situation, which, of course, hasn't been fully resolved until today, but in 1999 it was really exploding. And then the Security Council was not able to formulate an approach. It was somehow not blocked, really, but no, none of the members of the Council was able to come with, an, with proposals of how to deal with that situation. In that moment, the General Assembly, the, the, the delegation of Democratic Republic of the Congo, moved a proposal in the General Assembly, mobilized the General Assembly. The Assembly started to exert pressure, and then the Security Council also adopted a policy which ended with creation of a peace operation in the Congo. And of course, negotiations that, that, were, um, that were conducted in South Africa before and so forth. So what I'm saying is that we have seen, even in the questions of peace and security, it is possible, not always, but on occasion, for the General Assembly to exert influence on the work of the Security Council in a productive way. Without that intervention of the General Assembly, I'm sure the Council would need at least another year to come to something. But then the process was accelerated. Uh, 
I would also like to remind you of Article 14 of the UN Charter, which gives the General Assembly the powers to deal with emerging situations. The General Assembly is not using those powers. Uh, when I was years ago discuss, um, you know, participating in discussions on the agenda for peace, the program proposed by Secretary General Butros Ghali, I insisted we have to empower the General Assembly through Article 14 and encourage it to be more proactive. And this is not happening. There is no constitutional obstacle to that. There are political obstacles which influence member states and the General Assembly. And I would hope that this will change. As Secretary General, I would certainly remind the General Assembly of its own powers. There were very few examples in the past when the Assembly used those powers. Just another example, uh, in the Austro-Italian dispute over the minority in South Tyrol, in, in Italy, uh, this article was used. Now, the General Assembly didn't say very much about the substance of dispute. It only encouraged the two states to expedite their political process to come to a negotiating table and resolve the problem. So in other words, it was recognized that the problem exists and that the two states have the primary responsibility to find a solution, which took them four years to formulate. It was then adopted as a package of agreements between the two countries and subsequently regularly reported to the General Assembly until 1994 or so, for about 30 years. Now, this tells us something about how the powers of the General Assembly can be used among two countries, friendly neighbors, members of the, well, not of the European community, which was not the case at the time, but certainly of a Council of Europe, of a very prominent regional organization. But they needed the UN to come to a solution of that. So the, the you know, proactive role of the General Assembly can be uh, strengthened on the basis of the Charter already. And then Article 99, I have thought a lot about that and I have worked with uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan on, let's say, 50 shades of Article 99. Because it's one thing to propose something formal to the Security Council as the Secretary General can do. He can uh, remind the Council that there is a problem of international peace and security and something has to be done and of course it is expected for the Secretary General to go beyond and say what is to be done. But as, you, as we all know, the Secretaries General have been generally quite cautious about using this article formally. But informally it is used very often. And I have been present on many situations when the Secretary General, especially Kofi Annan, was very imaginative in exploring possibilities of action and some of those actions that did come to fruition as a result. So I can say that if I was elected to the post of the Secretary General, I would use Article 90, 99 on a daily basis. Not always formally, but I wouldn't hesitate to do that as well if the situation was, it was ripe for a more formal use of Article 99. Uh, now, on the use of force, I would say that uh, the world and the UN has learned an important lesson in the past 15 years or so. That use of force should not be exercised except in self-defense and with appropriate authorization of the UN Security Council. We have seen the negative effects of using force outside those frameworks. Now, there are certain aspects which are not yet fully clear. One of them is the prerogatives of the regional organizations, which have grown in stature and importance, and organizations like African Union has, have also adopted constitutional changes which allow for authorization at the regional level without reference to the Security Council. But the practice has shown that it is not so easy to invoke this sort of approach, that it is really more sensitive and that there are very good reasons to rely on Security Council and its primary responsibility. As I said before, primary responsibility is not exclusive. And other actors, including regional organizations and the Secretary General, have very good basis to 
work with the Security Council and figuring out in figuring out what exactly is the way to go ahead. So I think that Article 99 and the questions of authorization of use of force are actually fairly closely connected in the actual practice. And it is really a part of the responsibility of the Secretary General to envisage those situations early enough, remind the Council of them, and then also to come with ideas of what to do about those situations. This was done in the past to some extent with success, but more success is necessary for the future. And then, uh, as regards the uh, gradual development of statehood of Palestine, uh, I think that here you refer to a number of steps that constitute that gradual formation. And uh, I think that the end station of this process is clear. It only takes a very long time. And we'll see how much progress can be made in the coming period. I cannot go beyond that because I really do not know. But I think anybody who has analyzed the process so far has seen the evolution which in which you refer to the final to the most recent stages but of course there were there was a gradual evolution even before that